Hallelujah. Thank you, choir, for that grace-filled uh, choral anthem. The sermon through which we will receive grace today is entitled King Utsaya Who Rebuilt the Destroyed Walls. Every month, we are reading each volume of the History of Redemption series. In January, we read Book 1. In February, uh, Book 2. And in um, April, it's Book 4. So among the contents of Book 4, I looked up uh, the place where it talks about the destruction and reconstruction of the walls. And it was in today's scripture reading. When we look at the church situation today, the city walls, which in other words is like the fence, it's important, right? Does our church have fences? How much? How many of them? The entire mountain is a fence. But think about it. If we don't have a fence in this kind of situation, it would be terrifying. So founding pastor, wherever he built the retreat centers, he built fences. And in our church as well. And even at the headquarters inside the church, there is there are fences. So biblically speaking, the fences or the city walls are so important. In Nehemiah's times, they were acknowledged as a country once the walls were rebuilt. So the walls must not be destroyed. Then through today's scripture reading, why was there a time when the city walls were destroyed? And when they were rebuilt, what kind of heart did the people have? Through Second Chronicles 26, verse 9, we're going to look at King Uzziah who rebuilt the destroyed walls. During King Amaziah's time, uh, King Amaziah of southern Judah, during his time, the city walls of Jerusalem were destroyed. And the one who rebuilt those walls was King Uzziah. So if you look in uh, this, church, uh, this chart, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Ahaziah, Athaliah, Joash, uh, Amaziah. And then Uzziah. From Ahaziah to Amaziah, um, they're all omitted. And especially King Uzziah's father, Amaziah, was also omitted. But we see that Uzziah was not omitted. Uzziah was the king who rebuilt the destroyed walls. Then why was Amaziah, uh, why did he just let the city walls be destroyed? And on the other hand, when King Uzziah rebuilt the walls partially, what kind of heart did he have? Are we curious or not? Even if you're not curious, you must say you are. First, we'll look at what kind of king Amaziah was. Amaziah surprisingly, was not wicked from the beginning, but he was a king who was good in the beginning, but turned uh, very wicked. And in the beginning, he was so obedient to the word, meaning even in a situation where it was impossible to obey, he obeyed the word. When there was a time of going to battle against Edom, King Amaziah, because he didn't have enough soldiers. In today's terms, it's like uh, trying to buy soldiers from North Korea. So Amaziah uh, brought 100,000 soldiers from the northern kingdom of Israel uh, by paying them. But when the prophet rebuked him, Amaziah obeyed and returned those soldiers he even paid the price for these soldiers, but it's not easy to return them, right? In Second Chronicles 25, verse six, verses 6 to 7, 
It reads, he hired also 100,000 valiant warriors out of Israel for 100 talents of silver. But a man of God came to him saying, O king, do not let the army of Israel go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, nor with any of the sons of Ephraim. The nickname for Israel is Ephraim. It's like saying, God is not with North Korea. And Amaziah came back to his senses saying, and he thought, oh, I made a mistake. So he obeyed and returned those valiant warriors back to northern Israel. And then he had victory with this battle against Edom. In 2 Chronicles 25, verse 11, it says, Now Amaziah strengthened himself and led his people forth and went to the valley of salt and struck down 10,000 of the sons of Seir. Even killing 1,000 is a lot, but we see that he struck down 10,000 people. Even Amaziah was astonished. But the problem begins here. Because they had this sudden victory, if there is prosperity without humility, that is a great test from God. Amaziah became proud. He became so proud. His shoulders were soaring up the sky. So even if there is a good thing, uh, it's better to come with some kind of trial and tribulation. But if you suddenly become rich overnight, then uh, there's a high chance that you will not come out to church anymore. So we see 10,000 people they struck down, and he became so proud, and he brought the idol from Edom and sacrificed before that. So it was a great sin. Then when the a man of God rebuked him again, he did not obey because he was so proud and arrogant. He even rebuked that man of God. Then the prophet proclaimed destruction upon him. So third, by the invasion of the northern kingdom of Israel, The, the 100,000 valiant warriors that went back to Samaria, God moved their, uh, stirred their hearts, made them angry so they would come back and invade the southern kingdom of Judah. And Amaziah should have come to his senses then, but still he did not. So by the invasion of the northern kingdom of Israel, the city walls of Jerusalem, uh, 400 cubits of the walls were destroyed. And that is a 182 meters. In 2 Chronicles 25, verse 23, it says, Then Joash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, at Beth Shemesh, and brought him to Jerusalem and tore down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, 400 cubits. So what's important here is that the corner gate was toward, torn down. Please remember this. Main point number two, what is the reason that the uh, city of Jerusalem fell during King Amaziah's time? Minor point number one, it's because he forsook grace. He brought the idol from Edom and served him. In Second Chronicles 25 verse 14, it says, Now after Amaziah came from slaughtering the Edomites, he brought the gods of the sons of Seir, set them up as his gods, bowed down before them, and burned incense to them. So how terrifying is a proud heart? If something good happens to us, if we're humble, then we would not think much of it. But you might let out a smile, right? But we need to be careful of that. So in book four of the History of Redemption series, it says that after having victory, Amaziah became proud. He forsook God's grace. And the moment that he brought the idol of uh, from Edom and served it, at that moment, God who knows our entire hearts. God had the 100,000 valiant, 100, valiant men of the northern kingdom of Israel who returned to Samaria, come back out of Samaria and to attack the cities of Judah. Minor point number one, it was because Amaziah was... Uh, carried away by the sense of victory. Second Chronicles 25, verse 11. 
prosperity when it comes when you're not ready and all of a sudden you become famous and rich, then when you're not ready, that's a very terrifying test from God. So what is humility? No, not knowing what you're doing well, not knowing what you're good at. Because you're so sick or because you're so busy, you don't know you're doing so well. If you say, I drive so well, I'm a good driver. It can become uh, something you can become proud of. Third, it is because he did not uh, heed the word. In other words, he did not uh, build the walls. In Nehemiah's times and also in our church situation now, we need to be good at two things at once. One is building the walls. And not only that, if the enemies come and destroy them, then uh, it's no use. But because we're so focused on protecting and blocking the enemies, then we don't build the walls. We don't read the Bible. And after just fighting and fighting, your soul begins to thirst. So we cannot neglect either any of them. Our faith always needs to be one of building the walls, reading the Bible and praying. And that is how we can uh, fight once again. But if you are always good at giving worship, but you don't come to protect the church, if everybody comes, the same people come and guard the church, but you don't come. For example, if a, a robber came to your house, who would say welcome? Just by hearing the news that a thief came to your house, even if you're at your workplace, you would come running, right? If your house is set on fire, who would say, oh, great, right? You need to come to guard the church. How important is it? So I asked the g u r u t a g i young adults, especially to the youngest ones, because I had a meal with them, and I asked them, who was the one that has been uh, in front of uh, the church in those extreme fights and everybody raised their hands and I was so sorry to them because those who were in that violent situation and experienced it themselves it's different from those who gave worship well but never came out for guarding the church then the sense of uh, being on site that's very different so You should not just say, a pastor, you go and guard the church. Guests are just uh, overseers, right? Or they are bypassers. But the saints who are like the pillar, they know every detail in the church, how the church runs and operates, the women's ministry. They are the masters. But the guests, just bec because they only come once and leave, they don't know what happens. They just only, they only care about their own souls. So today we must need to be fervent in giving worship, but also in guarding the church. If you came once, then now you should come twice. If you came out twice, you need to come three times. So I believe you'll be good at both. In 2 Chronicles 25, verse 16, as he was talking with him, the king said to him, Have we appointed you a royal counselor? Stop! He scolded him, right? Why should you be struck down? Then the prophet stopped and said, I know that God has planned to destroy you because you have done this and have not listened to my counsel. So this prophet is a very brave person, right? If Amaziah felt fear from his words, he would have repented. Fourth, it's because Amaziah consulted his servants more than God. In 2 Chronicles 25, verse 17, it says, Then Amaziah, king of Judah, took counsel and sent to Joash, the son of Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, the king of Israel, saying, Come, let us face each other. Took counsel, what does this mean? Uh, 
So it says that he um, took counsel, he talked with the servants. In Hebrew, to counsel is yachts, and it means to give advice. In book four, it says Amaziah heard the advice from his servants, and he was captured by his um, desire to have victory and his desire for fame, and he became uh, furious. And in order to take revenge for what hap what they were, uh, what what Israel did to, to them. Amaziah declared war against King Joash. So if we were to summarize what we heard until now, during King Amaziah's time in Jerusalem to Edom, they went out to battle. And in the beginning, they relied on 100,000 valiant warriors from northern kingdom of Israel. But after God rebuked them, uh, Amaziah returned them back to Samaria. And then the 100,000 valiant warriors, the moment Amaziah brought and served the idols of Edom, God had those valiant warriors come back from Beth Shemesh, and they killed 3,000 people and invaded Jerusalem. So King Amaziah declared war against the Uh, king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And they, the 100,000 valiant men even took Amaziah as a captive and destroyed the walls, 400 cubits. Third, what kind of king was Uzziah who rebuilt the destroyed walls? And what's amazing is that first, he became king at the age of 16, but he was bright in the word. What age do you think Solomon became king? I won't ask you to raise your hands. He became king at the age of 20. The founding pastor said, as a king, 20 years old, that's very young. We might think, how can he become a king? But a founding pastor said, it is so fortunate that he became king because he doesn't know anything and he became king at a young age. All Solomon did, all he could do was pray. And he said his um, knees became like the knees of a camel. That's how much he prayed and he was able to receive the gift of wisdom. King Uzziah too, he became king at the age of 16 Although he was so young, he was very bright in the word. Second Chronicles 26 verse 1 reads, And all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the place of his father Amaziah. 16 in the Korean age would be um, the last grade of middle school or the first grade of high school. Who was the king who became king at the earliest, youngest age? Joash. Joash became king at the age of six. The baby that was hidden, he became uh, 16 years old. And King Josiah became king at the age of 18. You know, 18 is a young age too, but how can this uh, babe, the little child rule over a country? But founding pastor said, although he's only eight years old, when Josiah became king, God gave Abraham's years and the gift of Solomon's wisdom and had him, had him uh, rule over the country. So we might think that person... Oh, it's not good enough, he's too young, or this or that. But for those whom God have appointed, He gives His wisdom and His power ability to them. So in this kind of situation, you might think, how can we evangelize the churches in such hardship? But if God is at work just once, 
not only will all the problems be resolved, not only will evangelism take place, but there will be a great wind of the History of Redemption series blowing. Let's read Second Chronicles 26, verse 5. He continued to seek God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding through the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God prospered him. Zechariah was the teacher of the word. As long as Zechariah was alive, they sought for God, and because they prayed accordingly, God made them prosperous. Now, prosperous, or God prospered him in Hebrew is chala, and it means to press forward no matter what happens. Our church has the city walls of the enemies ahead of us. They are there four times a week. But we cannot break through the enemy's walls. What's important is knowing the word clearly and praying. Please believe that we must build the city walls of prayer. And also a life of knowing the word clearly, knowing uh, we need to live that kind of life. And around us, may we not be filled with people who are very bright in money, but may we be surrounded by the people who know the word clearly and love the word. That is the city walls. May we, all of us become a city wall. And may the walls of our lives, especially of prayer and the word, be uh, built highly. Secondly, King Utsaya uh, fortified the walls of Jerusalem and the towers in Jerusalem. In Second Chronicles 25, verse 21, it says, So Joash, king of Israel, went up, and he and Amaziah, king of Judah, faced each other at Bethshemesh, uh, which belonged to Judah. Here we don't see towers, right? But in Second Chronicles 26, verse 9, it says, Moreover, Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate and at the valley gate and at the corner buttress and fortified them. Now, what is a corner buttress? When we look um, in the original Hebrew, it's the corner. So in the corner, towers were built to fortify them. And fortify in Hebrew is hazak, meaning to hold strongly. No matter how extreme the enemies hinder us, please believe that God is holding on, clasping onto our church, and grasping our saints as well. And I hope that you will all be captured by God's word. But if you're seized by money, just like we heard during second service, uh, money becomes your everything and it becomes your God. Second Chronicles 26, verse 9, in the NLT version says, Uzziah built fortified towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate, and at the angle in the wall. He also constructed forts in the wilderness and dug many water cisterns. So even if the uh, city walls are strong, but if you don't watch over them in a tower, if you don't care if enemies come or not, then the walls would be destroyed. Uzziah believed that the, the problem uh, with the walls being destroyed was because there were no towers. And Uzziah was so interested in this problem uh, issue of the city walls. So in this illustration, you can see that from the corner gate until the valley gate, they were renewed. 
And in this section, there were three towers. How severe were their uh, guardings? Let's say there are three groups uh, in the guarding team. It's as though there were 10 groups. And they observed the situation very carefully with a heart that they will not let the walls be destroyed again. And in the Bible, what or who must be our uh, tower in Psalm 61 verse 3. It says that uh, God is a refuge for us and a tower of strength against the enemy. So how important is a tower? Even if we're surrounded by enemies on all four directions, if we hide in the refuge that God has prepared for me, then we are not um, captured like David. But even if the walls are high, and there are no towers, then the enemies can break through. But in Proverbs 18, verse 10, it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. So if God watches over me and our district, please believe that darkness will not seep through. So the corner gate was destroyed. In Hebrew, corner gate is pinna. And it refers to the rock that's been placed at the very edge of a building. So it cannot be tilted even a little because the more uh, they build upon this, the whole building becomes a uh, slope. Uh, in this illustration, we see the cornerstone in the very bottom. But if it is crooked, then the whole temple will become crooked. So the cornerstone is Jesus Christ. The beginning of our life of faith is only Jesus. That's in Ephesians 2, verse 20. It says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is, a, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. The cornerstone, Jesus Christ, is the foundation of our li life of faith. And also we, as the stones that are connected to each other, Every single person is important. You might think, oh, that person doesn't come out to the guarding of the church. Don't even let him or her know. But no, we must um, tell them good words. You know, in Aesop's fable, a man was passing by in the cloud and the sun was fighting, right? The wind tried to, uh, the cloud tried to blow wind uh, to blow away the clothes, but the, he, um, the man wore them because it became even colder. But the church is like the sun. It's a warm place. Although we fight with our enemies, we need to be able to switch our modes quickly. If we just fight and that's it, What is the answer? It's important to be good at both. So if you have experience fighting at the front yourself, because we are connected, we need to become united as one to become a strong city wall 
So even if we're good, uh, if that person is good at guarding the church and fighting, but uh, he or she is not good at this, when we understand each other and when we speak kind words, then the warm breeze starts to blow and we become united in one. Third, Uzziah was a king who received God's help. In Second Chronicles 26, verse 15, it says, In Jerusalem he made engines of war invented by skillful uh, men to be on the towers and on the corners for the purpose of shooting arrows and great stones. Hence his fame spread afar, for he was marvelously helped until he was strong. So it was not that Uzziah was smart himself, but he received this marvelous help from God. And please believe that this kind of marvelous help will come from God for our church as well. Lazarus in Bethany died. Bethany means a house of gift. But this was a suffering because he could no longer receive the help from God in our lives, in our families. Uh, may we receive this marvelous help from God. Please believe that all the problems will be solved. In conclusion, what is the significance of the city walls to the believers? First, it is the clear standard in Proverbs 25, verse 28. Proverbs 25, verse 28. It's not that we must only not waver when trials come, but even when good things happen, we must uh, fall to the ground, prostrate, and be humble. Even until now, if you have overcome trials very well, but if good things come about, and when, you try, and when you begin to smile when nobody's seeing and you become proud, that is very terrifying, right? So we must not be like that. So those who have a high city wall, when they make a determination, they keep it. And whatever temptation comes from the world, they can overcome them. But if your city walls, if your wall is low, then you believe according to your mood. You say things that you should not be saying even if you say, uh, don't tell anybody else, even those words will spread. So keeping our hearts, that is building city walls. And second is the adorning of the bride. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. If you confess, I will only believe in the word. I will only give glory to Father God. Please believe that we need to have this kind of adornment as a bride. So, the, so heaven is also a wall, city wall, because it's the city of New Jerusalem. When our bridegroom, our Lord, comes again, when our city wall of faith is high, when our walls of grace is very high, then that is the proper adornment as a bride. If Even if you receive grace, you go home and you get angry and you just pour out all of your grace, we must not do that. So we need to keep our hearts. No matter what, uh, circumstances arises, you need to keep your heart, fortify your heart. Just like Uzziah fortified uh, the city walls. Hazak. When God grasps and hold on t holds on to our hearts, please believe that our, uh, we will become an unwavering wall. This I bless you in the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father God of love, today in our church, there are many difficult situations. If not for your marvelous help, we will waver and we can be destroyed. 
Therefore, we ask that you will have pity on our church, all of the problems of suffering in Bethany, just like you gave, uh, you uh, brought Lazarus back to life. May we also be brought back to life. Whatever tribulations may come about, whatever good things may come about, may we only look toward God. May we not waver, but have a firm, fortified wall of grace. May we not pour down our grace on the ground. Each of us, all of the grace that we have received until now through them, may we only give glory to God. Believing that will happen, we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who is full of love with thanksgiving. Amen.